Uh, I mentioned the other day that the uh, I like to call him Build a Burger because I like to make fun of people and, <laughs> and and primarily people in my family and people that know me know that I I make fun of names like that and I do it so much that I end up accidentally putting it in my regular speech. So I, as I went back and listened to my podcast from the other day, instead of saying. Uh, Bilderberg, uh, Bilderberg group. When I was talking about the Bilderberg group, I was calling them Bilderberger because I, I've constantly joked about that they don't sound all that threatening like a New World Order. They sound more like a uh, a do-it-yourself hamburger stand. But anyway, uh, the Bilderberger group, and I'll try to say it correctly so that uh, throughout this here, so so I'm not making fun of them. I wouldn't want to make fun of them. Anyway, um, when you think about these people, you really don't need uh, foil hat conspiracy stuff because they provide for you plenty of fodder uh, without having to make anything up. Um, if, if you're not familiar with the Bilderberger, Bilderberg group, <laughs> they're a, a, an organization that has met regularly since the early 1950s. And they are extremely secretive. They are some of the richest people in the Western world and, uh, and a collection of uh, hand-picked politicians. And they meet regularly, usually every year, and they discuss secret things that, no one, that they won't talk about with anyone. And they don't have any kind of recording of what they're talking about. There's no notes. There's no uh, nothing like that. And they refuse to tell... Uh, you know who who is even there we do know some of the people that are there because observers of the group um, watch and they take notes every year and they see who shows up and who leaves and things like this so uh, this year they're meeting in Virginia and uh, I can't remember the name of the big fancy hotel but they're meeting in Chantilly Virginia and the and there's some of the Occupy people are going out there they they estimate that there's probably going to be over a thousand of the Occupy people there to uh, to protest the uh, Bilderberger, Bilderberg group. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just, I can't say it. Anyway, um, now, so, so should we fear these people? Are they a conspiracy? Are they, you know, well, sure, they're a conspiracy. I mean, anytime you get people together, um, people. Anytime people of power come together uh, and plan things, it's a conspiracy. And even when people with little power get together to plan trying to get more power, that's a conspiracy too. So, in in essence, it's a conspiracy. But and to think about them or to talk about them has a tendency to be translated as, "Oh, well, you're a conspiracy theorist." Well, no, I, yeah, I, I suppose so. You know. I mean, if you see three people on the other side of a city park and they're talking and you lean over to the guy next to you and you go, I wonder what they're talking about over there, then uh, at the moment that you speculate as to what they are talking about, you're a conspiracy theorist. So so I, what I want to say, I want to avoid any of the really wild foil hat stuff, and I want to look at this as logically as possible to see what these people are and what they really, you know, if they really provide a threat or, you know. So just think about this for a second. If you just set aside all the fear and all the conspiracy theories and all of the, you know, the lizard people and the everything like that, just set that aside for a second and just think about this. If you are the kind of a person who believes that mankind needs uh, needs leadership to steer them. You believe that mankind uh, does not act in their own best benefit, in their own best interest. That mankind needs, you know, if you believe the the general statist way of thinking that given the opportunity, humankind would just fall on itself and fight to the last bitter end for the last man standing. If, if you believe these kinds of things that, that, are, that are really the heart of the, of the statist mentality, then you should believe, oh, and also, if you hate war. If you believe that men tend toward war and you think war is a bad thing, 
And if you think human beings need to have a heavy hand over them to keep them from attacking and fighting each other, if you believe these things, then, uh, then naturally you tend to believe the myth of the state. You tend to believe that uh, it's good for some people to have the authority to use aggression to keep people in control. Control. Um, and that being the key, control. So the Bilderberg group um, is clearly statists. They, they are clearly statists. And they, uh, they clearly believe that some people should be in control and some people should rule. Um, and they clearly believe that they are those people in society who are gifted to the point of where they have been, they and their families have been so successful financially that they know a lot more about this stuff than the rest of us. We're, you know, us down here, us little people, we're just goons and we're just idiots and we're just, you know, sludging along through life, uh, barely picking our knuckles up out of the dirt as we walk. And, and, you know, if you believe these things, if you already accept in your mind that there are, that the more successful people in society uh, should be granted advantages because, uh, you know, even if you look at it, I, I'm trying to make an argument in their case. If you look at it from an evolutionary point of view and you say, well, you know, uh, the more successful should be rewarded and the less successful should be held down. They shouldn't be, they shouldn't have uh, reproductive um, advantages and you know if there's too many of them they can they can be harmful to the species these things start to be the natural way of thinking if if you just follow through the the myth of the state to its logical end then you have to come to the conclusion that certain people should rule over the rest of humanity and certain people should uh, should be allowed to use aggression in order to maintain that position of rule. So, so you don't have to be a crazy conspiracy theorist to realize uh, if you accept the concepts of the state as being legitimate and you just follow through those concepts to their logical end, then indeed some people in society should rule over all the others. And if you have two or three or ten or a hundred of these individual groups ruling over people, then the individual groups are going to clash. So the fewer of those individual groups, uh, the better. That way, there's less opportunity to clash. In other words, if you have a, if you have a, a France and a Germany, then you have the opportunity for France and Germany to fight. But if France and Germany um, have the same uh, have the same head. Uh, you know, the, the same uh, leadership structure, then France and Germany will never fight because, in essence, it's the same. It, it would be fighting itself. And so if you take this out to its logical end, there should be only one state, and it should be global. Now, that's not a, that's not a conspiracy theory. It's just following out statism to its logical end. And the way the statist then begins to believe is that the way you end war is to end individual countries and have one state. Now, this is ignoring a lot of the anarchist argument, the, anar ar and the anarchist argument being the reason that governments fight is because they're based on the state. When you have uh, societies without a state-based government, they don't fight. And they settle their things on small family levels, uh, like what I was talking about with the clans, and it never gets to the point of war. But when you have a state, the state is founded on immorality, and so it doesn't matter if you have a thousand states or if you have one state, it doesn't matter. It's still founded on immorality, and it's still uh, imposing aggression on people, and that's immoral no matter whether there's peace or war. So, so it is a different philosophical angle that you're looking at this, but for the builder, uh, for the Bilderberg people, they see themselves as being highly successful, and there's quite likely a level of compassion, and possibly guilt, 
at them being so uh, successful and then looking down on the rest of the world as it struggles. And so they feel an obligation to fix this by all getting together and working towards one single state, which would end all war, and a great vast network of distribution of goods so that no one starves. Well, as your mind goes in those directions, you're, again, you're talking about socialism. And it doesn't matter how compassionate you are, and it doesn't matter what your uh, your intent is. Once you accept aggression as being legitimate and you accept central planning as a method to try to uh, improve the lives of people, you've accepted the two fallacies that both statism and socialism are based on. And you lose the ability to allow the market to control itself. And you begin to central plan the market And then all the problems and distortions that come with central planning come into play, and um, you have people starving to death. So if these people were both compassionate and intelligent, if they were were as compassionate as they fancy themselves, and if they were as intelligent as they fancy themselves, they would see the immorality uh, of what they're trying to do. But they don't, because because they're they're taken with this belief in the state. The last thing I wanted to point out about them is that there is a, a real alluring aspect of the state. It's a it's an aspect of the state that even no matter what your beliefs are, uh, unless you really are founded solidly in the concepts that that the state is based on evil, it's based on aggression. You can't do wrong and make something good happen. You know, two wrongs don't make a right. And unless you're really founded in these things, it's really easy to be tempted when you have the opportunity to use the power and the aggression of the state for what you perceive as good. Even if the person... Um, you know, I'm thinking of all, i go back and beat up the Ron Paul people again. I'm thinking of all the Ron Paul supporters who honestly believe that the state is bad and they, and they, and many of them, many anarchist Ron Paul supporters understand that the aggression of the state is immoral. And yet the allure, the, 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 the temptation that maybe we could use the state to just move the government back towards liberty to a certain amount just to just to lighten it up a little bit or maybe make it a little bit better during our lifetime and but but these things uh this this candy this this mind candy that that attracts you into using evil to accomplish good it it goes against what you yourself know um and this is the even the case with these bilderberg uh, people, and, and by the way, that's uh, if you don't know, they're named after the original hotel that they met in. Uh, I believe it was in the Netherlands where, when the original group first met. That's how they got the name Bilderberg. So, anyway, but uh, this year among the people meeting, and uh, reportedly this is, this person is on the steering committee, whatever the steering committee is, is um, I'm probably going to mispronounce his name, Peter Thiel or P- Peter Thiel. He's the co-founder of PayPal, and he was a big investor in Facebook. And people regularly point him out as a libertarian and say, oh, he's, he's very libertarian. He's helped libertarian causes, and he talks about libertarian things and so forth. And yet here he is at Bilderberger uh, meeting with some of the most statist individuals on the planet. And how can that be? How can he be a libertarian and still be meeting with the Bilderberg group? Well... It's it's exactly like the thing with Ron Paul. It's the idea that, you know, maybe maybe I can use my power and my influence and this and this uh, this mechanism of aggression. Maybe I can use it for good and I'll but I'll put it down when I'm done. I promise I'll put it down. You know, I just want to use the ring, to, uh, just just long enough to just do this one thing, and 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 then I'll put it down. I'll take it off. I'll never put it back on again. That's that's the mentality that comes with this, and it's far uh, it's far too tempting for any human, 
And, you know, we, we so often people talk about Ron Paul like almost like he's, well, like he's saint-like or like he's superhuman in a way. Like somehow these powers will not affect him. Somehow he's not going to be drawn to the dark side or whatever. And yet, um, whether we're talking about this guy, uh, the co-founder of PayPal, whether we're talking about Ron Paul, or whether we're talking about anybody else that is tempted to use the aggression of the state to try to do good with it, um, you're, you're becoming the very evil thing that you know deep down in your heart is wrong. One other thought I wanted to leave you with before I stop talking about these, this builder uh, Bilderberg group. I said it right that time. took me two t- attempts, but I said it right. Anyway, um, a lot of people put, uh, a lot of people in the conspiracy tending direction put a lot of power and authority into, the, into these people's hands. They really accredit them with almost everything bad that happens. But you have to keep in mind something. And, and I'm not saying that the Bilderberg group is good or that they're trying to do good or that, you know, I'm, I, I, I think they are either evil or they are seriously deceived or what's most likely is the combination of people there, uh, the people there are a combination of both heavily deceived and sincerely evil. Um, I don't have much hope for somebody like David Rockefeller that there's any, you know, any good in him at all. But uh, but I hate to make that decision. He could be just you know seriously seriously demented and and not realizing that everything he's doing and touching turns to evil no matter what his intent is. But uh, anyway, um, the thought that I want to leave you with on this is that their their influence is is not magical and it's not all encompassing and they do not have the kind of power that is commonly attributed to them the whole societal breakdown that we're seeing across the united states and across the west and western uh, culture is not from the bilderberg group you know you can't accredit this this little pocket of statists you can't accredit them with things like cracking down on uh, lemonade stands and bake sales and tomato gardens and you know it, it, they they are not the cause of these things but what causes a city council in you know in some small town in Iowa the thing that in that that motivates and causes a city council in some small town like that to crack down on some kid's lemonade stand or some church in Pennsylvania that gets attacked by a local uh, county commissioner because they don't have the right permits to have a, a, a potluck at their at their church or you know uh, some some overly zealous uh, federal agent somewhere that decides that you can't have this this evil you know unpasteurized cheese and and uh, when when you start to see all these things on so many levels of government, starting from the smallest town councils all the way up to the idiots that control New York City that decided here lately that they're going to make laws as to how big a, a, a glass of soda can be served in a, in a restaurant. All these people on all these levels are not acting ridiculously like this uh, aggressing upon the public because the Bilderberger group meets once a year and talks about what you know international policies they can try to get passed. The problem in the in deep down in the root of the tiny little city council all the way to the big city uh, controls in a place like New York City and the federal controls that are you know uh, attacking milk uh, raw milk farmers and. Uh, and all the way up to the to these people at Bilderberg Group, the the flaw is not a small group of evil people. The flaw is the belief that you can use aggression upon other people to accomplish what you believe to be good. So, yeah, Bilderberg Group might have the power to choose the next president. They might have the power to choose 
which country is going to be attacked by the United States next or whether or not NATO is going to start bombing another Middle Eastern country. They may have that kind of power. But they have that kind of that that kind of evil flows because of that belief, because of that core uh, myth that the state is a good thing and that the state can accomplish good and that using aggression and forcing people can ultimately produce a good. That's the flaw of the Bilderberg group. Not that they're ultimate rich trying to control the world and trying to bring a one world society or a one world government. That's not the problem. The problem is deep down in the philosophical belief that, that what they're doing is good. That it's good to use aggression to accomplish your means. Oops, I said that backwards. Use aggression as the means to accomplish your ends. That's the core that's wrong with the Bilderberg Group, and it's wrong with the city council in some small Iowa town, and it's wrong with the county commissioner in Pennsylvania, and it's wrong in, this, in New York City in the, in the halls of the mayor's office, and that's what's wrong in Congress. And I don't know if you saw it or not. There's a, uh, there's a YouTube video that's floating around that's, that's getting, uh, becoming viral of some, I believe it's an Illinois... Uh, an Illinois uh, a politician of some kind on the Illinois House floor, I believe. I could be wrong on that. And the guy is just losing it. I mean, he's scream, literally screaming mad, throwing papers in the air, smacking at the microphone. And he's just beside himself with anger. And the point of his anger is that the democratic process is not working in their political body that they have there. And one party is just running roughshod over the other. And um, and the leadership of that of that body, and again, I believe it's like the the uh, state house or whatever. But his claim is that the leadership of that body is uh, is distorting the political process and and distorting uh, you know the democratic processes, and uh, and he's failing to do what he thought he could go into government and do. Because of these processes that are put in place, or that are that are in place, that are preventing him from properly serving the public. Well, again, he's missing the real point. It's not that the processes are wrong. It's that your belief that you can go into government and use the aggression of government upon people and accomplish good. See, the only way you can do that, logically, if you think this through as a statist... The only way you can do that is if you're the one with the power. But since there's millions of us, we all think that the end goal of whatever, we all have a different idea of what the end goal of good would be. Because deep down inside every single human being, their first desire, this is coming from, from the most primitive animal um, aspects of our nature, the most primitive desire and the most base desire within each and every human being is individual survival, to fill our own desires and needs first. Even, even when we do things, even when we do acts of compassion and love towards people, it's, still, it's because deep down inside we want to feel the satisfaction that comes with doing a good deed for another human being. So, so yes, we do something kind for someone, but when we but that satisfaction that you feel when you do something kind is a reward system that causes you to want to do something kind again to someone else ultimately doing a kind deed becomes an act of selfishness i'm doing the kind deed because it feels really good to help somebody so when you echo that outward and you th realize that there are millions and millions and millions of people billions of people with each individual one of them ultimately having their own individual desires as the number one priority, then it, then it becomes illogical to think that any one of those people can then make decisions for others that would turn out to be best for them. Because no matter what, deep down inside, your number one concern is yourself. No matter how compassionate towards other people are, you're seeing it through a set of glasses that are tilted towards your own desires. So, so the mayor of New York decides, well, it's bad for people to have too much sugar in their diet. It's bad for them to drink these syrupy drinks with, that are packed full of corn syrup. So what can we do to help them? 
And it's his desire to have less sugar in his diet, and it's his idea that these syrupy drinks are bad. But instead of him using that on himself and saying, well, then I'll just drink less, his desire to help other people causes him to bring aggression on other people and say, well, we'll just make it so that nobody can have that. We'll put restrictions and limitations on other people based on what I believe is best for me. And when the mayor of New York does that, or when a city council in Iowa does that, or when the Bilderberg Group does that, or when the President of the United States does it, or when Ron Paul does it, it doesn't matter who does it. When you take it upon yourself to place your laws upon other human beings, you're ripping that fruit off the tree, and you're making the decision, what is good and evil? And you're placing yourself in the position of God, and you're saying, I'll be on the throne, I'll be the lawmaker, I'll be the decision maker, I lift myself up and I become a God. And that's what you're doing. When, when you do that, when you take the force of government, the aggression of government, and you inflict your will on others, that's exactly what you're doing. You're making a God of yourself. And it doesn't matter uh, if you're in a major group of, of unbelievably wealthy people like the Bilderberg group, or if you're just a politician trying like that guy in that in the in the Illinois house that's just trying his best to do what he thinks is good for his constituency. Or if you're in a town council, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what level you are. Or if you're Ron Paul running for for the presidency. It doesn't matter. If it's your desire to get a hold of that ring of power and use it even if you want to use it for good, you're still desiring to use the aggression of government to force your will on other people. So that even somebody, even this Peter Thiel or Thiel, whatever his name is, the co-founder of, the co-founder of PayPal, let's just give him the benefit of the doubt. Let's say he was a very libertarian, as they like to say, or a good libertarian or whatever. Let's say he was a philosophically consistent libertarian. Is that a better way to put that? Let's say, let's say he was a philosophically consistent libertarian at one point in time. But when he gets the opportunity to you know, do good, and he says, they've invited me to this. Maybe I can go in there and maybe I can do good. Well, and he, maybe, he even, maybe he even uses the kind of logic where he says, well, really, this is a voluntary group of entrepreneurs and, and this is not actually a government. So Bilderberg Group is not like the government. They, they're not, they don't have an army that works for them. They don't have that kind of power. But ultimately, who, who puts legs on the things that the Bilderberg Group uh, decides on? Well, when they go out and they then individuals among that group, when they hire lobbyists, when they put influence on government, when they you know, support... Uh, a cause with money that ultimately uh, goes back and influences government. One way or the other, even though the Bilderberg Group is a voluntary association, and therefore, you know, Peter Thiel or Thiel or whatever his name is, even though he may be able, as a libertarian, he may be able to justify being a part of it because it's not a political body, even at that that because of the power that they weld with the kind of wealth that they have, and that wealth came from the system uh, that we have now with state-dominated industry, with, with corporations that exist strictly because the state makes it possible for them to be a corporation and exist. Because of all these levels of interference of the state, even a voluntary group like that, uh, when it exercises um, influence upon governments, they are, in fact, using the aggression of the state to accomplish their, their goals. But you can see how it would be so tempting, how the allure, how the siren song would be so sweet that you just couldn't resist and you'd have to. Even, you know, it's been said about the, the sirens. That's, that's a good one. Uh, it didn't matter 
how many skeletons and skulls were piled up on the beach. It didn't matter the amount of human bones that were on the beach. The sailors would still steer their boat right towards the rocks. It didn't matter that there, that there, were, that there were wreckage all over the rocks from previous ships. When the, when the sirens would begin singing and calling to the sailors, they would just lose their mind and go right towards the rocks. And that's what the state does to you. That's, that's how powerful the allure of power is. It, it is far, I, I speak for myself, I don't think I would be able to resist that kind of, that kind of temptation. Uh, and I, I hope I've, I'm never tempted that way. But to put someone else in that position and vote them in hoping they can do it, when you yourself, deep in your mind, you know, you know you would not be able to handle that kind of temptation then why would you think somebody else could? Why would you put them in a position to be tempted like that?